Good evening, and welcome to the Sound Off Show. My name is Linda Kirker. I host the program, and I thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, lots, of, lots to discuss tonight, and I have one of my favorite guests on the show, so I'm excited about that. Before I introduce him, I just have a couple of quick openers. Um, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, Noah Webster, said this. Please listen carefully. If the citizens, that's you and me, neglect their duty and place unprincipled men in office, men and women, the government will soon be corrupted. If government fails to secure prosperity and happiness, it must be because the citizens neglect the divine commands and elect bad men and women to make and administer the laws. Now is the time, folks. We are slowly losing the power of the people given to us by the founders of this nation. The real problems will come, and there will be no returning to the promise of individual freedom, rights, and opportunity. So we have had a number of years where our freedoms and our rights, and even today we have people trying to deprive us of, of our, our national principles that we were founded upon and our religious freedoms and, and free speech rights and so much else. And I implore you once again, as I often do, to please, 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 pay attention to what's going on in your country. Make sure you know who you're voting for when you are ready to vote, and make sure you do vote. But don't, don't be an uninformed voter. Okay, that's my opener. Now I have the pleasure of welcoming back to the program, Mike. Hi, Lennon. Linda. Good to see you. Good <laughs> yeah. to see you again. Yeah, great right. to have you back. Make sure it's Lennon, L-A-N-N-O-N, not Lennon and not Landon. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, well, you you no longer are, are hosting your show down in Rutland. Oh, yeah. Oh, you are? Oh, Good. Have, oh, I still have my TV show down in Rutland. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. good for you. Rutland's still the uh, last bastion of really good, solid conservatives. We have three senators from Rutland County that are... Uh, conservatives and uh, we have uh, three of the four uh, representatives from Rutland that are um, conservatives and it's interesting to note that the one non-conservative uh, legislator comes from the ward in Rutland that has the greatest number of transients and the greatest number of people that are on some form of government assistance. Really? So, so it's, it's amazing well, to look at the statistics well, and well, see that. I have to stand up for Franklin County. We have uh, a pretty high number, uh, a big percentage of our overall delegation is um, Republican, and our two state senators are Republicans. That's, that's good to hear. See. So I'm proud of the people for recognizing um, that we have to change things in this state, and we're certainly up against it. We, we um, as Noah Webster, as you read about Noah Webster, and as he pointed out in the quote that you made, is that we have to stand up and be ready to discern what we're hearing, discern what we're reading, and do our civic duty. And most people have no clue. Uh, they, don't, they don't get into it like you and I and, and, and watch it daily and, and worry ourselves to death about oh, it. Oh, boy, but, do um, I. <laughs> And, and they just feel that um, somehow or another uh, everything will be okay and that they can't lose their, their rights. It's like, the, it's like the frog that gets put into the uh, cold water on the burner. And then the burner gets turned on slowly. And by the time they realize it, What's they, happening? that they've got to get out, they can't jump out and they're, and they're basically cooked to death. So that's really what we have to be, uh, be concerned about because this is the only country in the world in what we would call modern history that has had this kind of government, government by men under God. That's the only country ever that's, that's even professed to have that kind of a belief. And as long as we uh, can continue to try to govern ourselves under God's 
uh, watchful eye, we, we should be successful, but we, we roll away from that quickly. Well, we are allowing um, in Franklin, uh, two, three years ago, there was one person who didn't want a prayer at the start of the town meeting, okay? So what about the rest of the people? Why couldn't that one person come in? You know, the, the uh, person heading the meeting could say to this individual, okay, the meeting starts at 8. We'll say the prayer at 8.05. Why don't you just arrive at 8.10 if the prayer offends you? That's but right. no, they take it away from everyone. Right. Um, that, that's so ludicrous. And of course, if you watch carefully about what's going on in this country in, the, in, in one in particular uh, religion, uh, there are movements afoot that they have prayer rooms in the public schools uh -huh. and people are literally going for it. We can't. We can't have uh, Judeo-Christian principles taught in the school. You can't have a Bible. I went looking for a Bible in the library just recently at a local school. Nothing. Um, and yet in the back wall there was the Koran. It's like, what? Are you serious? Seriously. And I could tell you the school, it's right here in the state of Vermont. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. So you can't have the Bible, but you can have the Koran. So who's influencing what and how is this all being changed? And that's like the frog in the pan, because nobody's going to voice an objection all of a sudden, that could be here, and we have a prayer room in a school, and and people are just going to say, "Well, that's okay. It's okay. It's not harming. Oh, yeah? It's not well, harming anybody." Well, I have news for you. We have. It's not okay. We have principles in this country. We have a founding principles based on Judeo-Christian religions, right? Those are the tenets that the, the founding fathers came to this country trying. Uh, to, well, they, they fled from their uh, native lands so that they could have these freedoms, so that yep. they wouldn't be told by their governments how they would pray and how they would uh, exercise their beliefs. So many of our founding fathers were uh, not deist, as the professors of the college world would have you believe. They were devoted Christian men. Uh, if you ever read a lot about George Washington, George Washington, uh, spent hours on his knees. Mm -hmm. There's a very famous painting, as a matter of yes. fact, uh, of, of him in front of his white horse, literally uh, praying. But he spent hours praying, and there's written re records of this from men that fought at Valley Forge and men that fought with him that have that written down, that that's what he did. Yeah. Well, uh, gee, George Washington, the Indians would say that he couldn't be killed uh, back in the French and Indian War. They tried, and they just said he's protected. He, 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 can't, be, he can't be harmed. Well, and it was Ben Franklin who encouraged at the Constitutional Convention where they were having such uh, a disagreement about how things should be in the new country, he suggested that they start every session with a prayer, and that they did. And eventually they worked things out in a, you know, in a positive manner. But 52 of the 56 signers of the Declaration, was it the Declaration or the Constitution? Uh, the Declaration of Independence was 52. Constitution, I think, is the same number. I'd have to they look were, that up. They were Christians. Right. That doesn't mean we can't have people from other religions in this country, but you respect our culture, you respect our principles of our nation and our laws, right? It, it, it does mean that when you uh, are reflective upon what the history is all about, that your reflection takes into account uh, the founding fathers' beliefs. That's what people try to throw away. And uh, well, they uh, say it's outdated. The well, they'll say it's outdated. Outdated, outdated because that's their goal to make it outdated. Well, there's a lot of people in this world that, uh, especially in New England right now or the Northeast, that that will tell you that the biblical principles are outdated. So that's man, man influencing what has been there for, well. 6,000 years, I guess. It's been a long time since the uh, Moses uh, went up on the mountain and brought down the uh, Ten Commandments. But a lot of people don't believe that stuff. They just think well, that it's all... A lot of people are not going to church oh, I know. today. I know. Well, when we've got, um, <laughs> just as an aside there, viewers, we have bombers for the last five nights flying over North Korea as a show of force for what North Koreans are doing with their ICBMs and bragging about the fact that they can hit any place in the United States. We now show our force, and we've got bombers flying over uh, North Korea 
with um, the statement being made that we will use full force. Well, the last time that we had a statement by the United States <laughs> government uh, that we would use full force, meaning everything we've got, uh, was John F. Kennedy against uh, uh, Cuba and Khrushchev from uh, the Soviet Union, and Khrushchev backed down. So uh, whether or not the nut job in North Korea would do such a thing, I don't know. But that will, that, to come back to the religious side of things, you get right in a hurry when you're in a foxhole, you get right with God in one heck of a hurry. I so bet if we you get do. into the if we get into the foxholes, we're going to have a lot of people back on their knees praying, and that's historically what happens. I mean, you you go away from God. Uh, the biblical principles are you go away from God, and then things happen, and boy, you come back. So I thought when I chuckled, I thought you were going to say Obama's red line. Oh well, he's, <laughs> we don't have a president right now that I believe is going to have a red line that that, that recedes. I think when he draws a red line, he's pretty much going to stand uh, by. Well, it. you know, he's a <clears throat> businessman. I mean, Obama never did a, did any work in his life, so um, productive work. Uh, Trump is a is a businessman, so he knows what a red line is. They have them in business all the time. I've been fortunate enough in my lifetime to work for three uh, Trump type businessmen, and they're all basically the same. They want what they want, and they want it done, and they don't want to be uh, messing around trying to figure out, well, did you do your job? Here's the goal, let's do it. Let's get it done. And if you don't get it done, and in a reasonable amount of time, you're, you're fired. It's that simple. You're and, fired. Uh, so, when people, <laughs> so when people see uh, uh, Trump firing people right now and they get all crazy, uh, I've, I've known presidents of com companies that hired people and got rid of them in a week. They hired the wrong person. And, you know, it, it, they can make, their, they make these quick judgments. Well, you've got to remember that when people are working on margins that are Probably in Vermont, most most companies in Vermont are working on three percent margin. Uh, you can't make a lot of mistakes; you're out of business. That's true. So, and and on top of that, you also have the government placing so many regulations on businesses, and and so many uh, well taxes that it's it makes it very difficult to do business in the state. I think it's I think it's really good that uh, President Trump. Uh, one of his very first executive orders was to demand that for every uh, rule and regulation, policy and procedure that was instituted in his administration, you had to subtract two yes. from the previous. Because as everybody knows that, that has to work with rules and regulations, policies and procedures, they just compound. Nobody ever seems to take them away. They, they, just, they, just, they just keep building and building and building until you're choked and you can't do anything that's... Uh, actively able to do it and it was it was very heartwarming today to see that the um, I think it was the uh, Homeland Security uh, well it wouldn't be Kelly because he's just gone in as uh, the um, yeah, Trump's the chief, uh, chief, of staff. chief of staff but <clears throat> I think it's his division but anyway they, they have by executive order now uh, rescinded all the uh, Environmental Protection Agency's uh, objections uh, on the building of the wall. The wall is going to be built, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm and, uh, into that. It's amazing. As I came to St. Albans tonight, there was a beautiful thing going on in the park, and, and I drove through town, and I came up the back street to uh, come to the studio, and I stopped and went back to the park because I, I saw the Border Patrol men down near the main street, and there was nobody there talking to them, and I got out of my car and went down and talked to the state troopers. There were three of them and two uh, uh, U.S. Border agents and I thank them very much for their duty Good for, for their for their um, for their involvement and you know it's a dangerous job these guys are in and state troopers and and most people just take it for granted these guys have no clue when they leave the house in in the morning if they're coming home neither do their families it's a very dangerous world out there and um, especially uh, for the last eight years where we've had an anti-police administration we've had um, uh, policemen uh, shot and killed for no reason, uh, a dangerous, dangerous time. So. Absolutely. <coughs> and the least, the very least that the Border Patrol c should be able to expect is cooperation from the state governments. Uh, this crazy thing about sanctuary cities, I'm certainly opposed to that. That's, that's uh, everything, that, everything that I can read about the sanctuary cities, uh, their policies and procedures, rules and regulations are anti-American law. Absolutely. And so they all go crazy. Vermont's one of them. At least uh, the new governor has indicated that he's not going to do too much. Um, well, shame on him because um, uh, that's, that's defying 
what we as American citizens have believed should be done to protect our rights. American citizens' rights, <coughs> absolutely. And um, so it's, who is it sanctuary for? We ought to be the ones that are being protected. Well, it's citizens. When you, when you have someone like, um, I've forgotten her last name, Kate, Kate's Law, and, and, and Kate was a young and woman. Steinle. Yeah, she was a beautiful woman that was shot dead by a guy that had come to this country and committed five felons, been thrown out of the country five times, and he came back in, took, took a gun, and shot her. That's craziness. <coughs> <coughs> so when I talked to the uh, Border Patrol guys tonight, I was talking, well, I guess the, the job would be much more dangerous on the southern border than it would be up here. And they looked at me and said, don't you count on it. They come across the Vermont border just as easily as they come across the southern border. I had someone who worked for the Border Patrol in Vermont tell me a couple of years ago that you would be shocked to know what comes through the Vermont border. If we think we have our heads in the sand, <coughs> we think that some craziness isn't going on. Well, you can fly into Montreal, <coughs> and then uh, once you uh, come down to Montreal, where, where are they going to stop you from coming into the woods across the border? We have, what, three or four border stations with roads. Well, if I'm going to illegally come into the state of Vermont, I don't come across your border station. I come across in the woods. Sure. Uh, I can come across in the winter in a snowmobile and get halfway down through Vermont before you even know I'm on the trails. <laughs> uh, maybe all the way down to, uh, used to be, I used to, I used to talk... Uh, and wrote a short story about this uh, coming down from Montreal and um, rigging up a uh, uh, torpedo like they did in Pearl Harbor that would just skim the surface to take down boats and come down on a snowmobile all the way to Vernon and take out that Yankee, uh, the Yankee plant. Well, mm -hmm. we don't have to worry about that right now. At least I think we don't have to worry about it. Maybe you could still do that. But I, I wrote a short story about that at one Good time. And, and uh, people couldn't believe that I even thought that way. But if I can think it, don't you think that someone that really wants to do damage really wants to do damage isn't thinking that way? Because nobody ever thought that they would take an airplane and make that into a rocket and take down two buildings in New York City either. There were a few people that said that was a possibility, but everybody just shrugged their shoulders and discounted and said, no, it'll never happen. Just like a lot of people watching tonight will say, uh, well, Linda and Mike, you know, you guys are older, you know, you, you've been around, but, you know, these things aren't going to really happen. Uh -huh. Well, that's what uh, Neville Chamberlain said uh, back in World War II. Uh, that's what was said in World War I, and that was said in the Civil War even, is that, is that these things would just never happen. So people would rather believe that war is not in our genes. Well, I think in the gene pool <laughs> there is war, because I can't read very much history from way back, from the biblical history all the way up to right now, <clears throat> that we haven't had a lot of wars. That's true enough. When, you, when you're talking about... Um sanctuary cities and, and so forth. What concerns me about what our state is doing, um, not having our sheriffs and our state police and our local police um, cooperate with ICE, um, Immigration and Cust Customs Enforcement. Um, here's, here's what my concern is. Word spreads fast. Vermont has one of the most generous welfare programs in the nation. And then if we're going to be protecting people who come here illegally, all of them are not going to be nice people. And I think we're going to, when word gets out that you can come to Vermont as an illegal and be protected by our governor, then I think, and plus, you know, take advantage of our generosity, I think that we're going to see an influx. Well, as you know, Linda... I hope I'm, I'm wrong. Well, I think you're right, because as you, as you um, <clears throat> indicated, I think in past shows or even tonight perhaps, I, I'm from Rutland, and uh, in the last election we had a mayor down there that decided that uh, <clears throat> refugees from uh, Syria would be a great thing. Unvetted, just bring them in. <laughs> and, and, you can't and, vet and, them. And he would have he probably... Uh, been able to get this done uh, if he took a year and a half or two years and began to teach the public why, how that might happen. But he didn't. He decided he would do this all on his own, under the table, nobody knew. Well, it was very, very interesting because he felt he was absolutely right. Well, in the election, 
he was thrown out of office by a huge number of people. So the people did step up and say, okay, that's enough of this, and they threw him out. Okay. Well, the other side of that coin is that he had also hired a fire chief for the fire, city firefighters who uh, had never fought a fire in his life. But that's, <laughs> that, 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 that's beside the point. So there was, those two things converged, and the vote, I think he got beat by 700 and some odd votes. It was, wow. it was a huge wow. smacking. Well, just recently he said he's going to make a comeback, and he still doesn't believe that the people understood what he was trying to do and that they just didn't understand him. We understood perfectly well. And, uh, that's pretty naive thinking. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's the same thing that's going on right now nationally, if you think about it. Uh, there's no way that the Republicans beat Hillary without collusion with the Russians. And there's been absolutely no proof given that I the know. collusion between Trump and Russia ever occurred. Plus, there's been, and we're spending millions of dollars per day to try to figure this out. Ridiculous. And, and then, plus, uh, we do know for a fact that there wasn't one single vote change by Russian uh, influence. So um, <clears throat> Hillary got beat fair and square because she didn't have a message, and uh, Trump has a message that is resonating with the working class of this country. People that have to work every single day and pay taxes understand what he's saying, and that is that we are about to lose our country if we don't come together and make this uh, the America that we always knew and loved and wanted to be. That's all true, Mike, and one of the things is that, I just wrote it down, we have almost $20 trillion debt in this country. That makes us vulnerable as a nation, folks, and we need people in Congress, along with the president, administration, to start paying down that debt. And, and get rid of a lot of these nonsense programs, feel-good programs that make people, you know what, if you have an idea for a program and it has value, you go out and sell it to the people who want to support it. And, and you're absolutely right. That's, that's, that's the American way of, of, of getting contributions, and we're the most generous nation even to this day with all of the rules and regulations. That Around are, the world. That, that we, we still give away more money generosity wise to the rest of the world than anywhere else. But I think pieces of that are coming to an end. I, I just did a study on the United Nations <laughs> and uh, there's the, the United Nations gets eight billion dollars a year from um, the uh, United States. Eight? Uh, eight? Eight billion. Eight billion a year. It's, uh, it's uh, close to uh, 30 percent of the uh, UN budget. And the next closest country, believe it or not, is at 10 percent, and that's China. And everybody else is underneath that. So when you have the president of the United States saying, wait a second, where's the bang for the buck? Where, where, I mean, this is a businessman looking at it just from a pure business sure. point of view. If I'm spending $8 billion a year and $3 billion is on, um, uh, believe it, climate change. Oh, come on. Uh, He's, he's got a right to say this is not a good deal for America. This is not a good deal. And I don't care where your political beliefs are on, the, uh, on, on climate change. Uh, when you're spending that kind of money, that's a redistribution of wealth. That's a redistribution of American wealth over to the rest of the world. No. I, I can see where he pulled out of the Paris Accord. Why, that, oh, that, me that, too. That makes sense. Just, and just TPP. Economically. Just makes I'm sense happy as a lark. <clears throat> That he pulled out of those. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't make deals that you're going to spend a fortune. You make deals where you're going to make at least, uh, you're going to at least break even, or you're going to make money. Those are what, those are the kind of deals that businessmen make. You, you don't go into, you don't go into business and and make deals where you're going to lose. Well, the United States government is a huge business. Yes, it Bottom is. Bottom line, it's a Way huge too business. Way too big. But it's got to be managed as a business, or we lose everything. And to continue to give away, give away, give away, give away, and not manage the things that are being given away corruptly. Well, and the UN votes against the United States principles all the time, and we're sending seven billion dollars a year. Ever are you since I was me? a boy, ever since I was a Eight boy, billion? I could study the history of the world and know that what's going on in the UN. The UN sits there with uh, the people that sit there are are from countries that are dictatorships, thugs. Uh, I mean, Africa uh, sends people that vote against us all the time. China votes against us. Russia votes against us. Bad deal. They want to control this country. <clears throat> well, that's, that's what you, Khrushchev said. You're familiar said with WOTUS, Waters of the U.S.? They want to control the water on your property, folks. Does that sound ridiculous? 
Well, it is ridiculous, but that is what the goal of the UN is, to control any property that has water on it, because they want to control all the waters, the streams, you name it. Uh, well, that's the new. That's the new globalization uh, yeah. mantra: is that we we will have we'll have one world government where the one world government is God run forbid. by whoever, and the one world government will will then control all the uh, natural resources necessary for for good living. And once that occurs, then if you're not a good person, you dare to voice an opinion like I do or like Linda does. Well, you'll be, you can be eliminated. All I have to do is you don't have any more water. Uh, uh, that takes care of you in about or three Or maybe weeks. you don't have a head anymore. Well, that <laughs> depends upon what part of the world takes over, exactly. But, uh, um, you know, it's interesting because pre-show pre conversation, we're talking about the progressive, socialistic, communistic uh, movement in the world. And if you watch the history of it all, uh, those dictators, that once they became into power, they used all the... Uh, tons and tons of professors to um, espouse the socialistic way. Well, look what and we have. Did, that's exactly right. But once they got into power, these professors wound up dead because they don't want thinkers. They don't want anybody to be in, in below the government that takes all. Independent. Independent. Okay. They do not want that to happen. So they, We, global, <clears throat> what, what is it about our country that keeps us free from a one world government it's our constitution and god well yes but uh, um, the, because we because we we and i don't want to talk about that bring me back to the polish speech by the, by the president by the president <laughs> but but because we we do believe in a god being that controls our destiny then that really generates our belief in, in the Constitution, because that's what the Founding Fathers did. Now, what the press won't tell you, if you go back and read this, you can read the entire speech. President Trump goes to Poland, his, his first major speech outside of the United States. It's, it's in July, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But, so he uh, talks to Catholic Poland, and there's a million people there. This is a huge crowd. And he talks for... 20 minutes of his 50-minute speech, and people have timed it out, you know, and, and, but he spends a lot of time on, and, and, and he talks about, we need God. And he says, Poland needs God, and, and this is what's got the, the press. People loved him. Oh, America needs God. And he said, so people are saying, wow, this is not a, quote, godly man. Uh, why, why, you know, well, those of you that are biblically principled, you know that uh, Moses was... Uh, <clears throat> chosen by God, nobody in a million years would have thought that a man that could hardly speak a word would be chosen uh, by God. And look at St. Paul, persecutor of the Christians was chosen by God. So, you know, you don't know how God works. And uh, so Donald Trump may be one of the greatest messengers, modern messengers of, of, of the faith, of, of the Christian faith uh, going, because it, it's amazing. Well, you know what I have found in my life um, as a child, and that's where many things that form us begin. Um, I was fortunate to have two great parents. We didn't have money. We were okay, you know, lower middle class maybe, but um, <clears throat> maybe middle class. But um, did, you, did you know? Because they loved you. You probably didn't even know if you had a you, you had a oh, no. a meal on the table, and and they loved you. Then that's that's what I had. I had exactly. no idea. Exactly, we a were meal poor. on the table, and your parents love you. <clears throat> and guide you, you know, and um, where was I going with that? Um, Talking about the belief system. Yeah, and it's, we, we ingrain in our youth these, uh, I went to church all the years that I was growing up, and um, I found that in the tough times, when my mom passed away, I was 19, and, um, she had gone back to work for her daughter to go to college. And um, it was a very, I mean, my mom was tough, but she was loving and taught me so many lessons about life and about, without realizing it, without me realizing it, about survival because I learned work ethic, personal responsibility. And when times got tough in life, that helped me to survive. Well, I think that's going to help again because uh, 
in, in the first six months of uh, Trump's administration, he's rescinded by executive order the Johnson Amendment, which which basically said that a preacher couldn't stand in the pulpit and talk politics. Well, he rescinded that, that rescinded right? It. Yes. So that yes. so that a, so that a preacher. Uh, can, can go up there and talk about the Judeo-Christian principles and say these are the things we should be thinking about. Without losing? Without losing the 501c3 st tax status. status. Exactly. Okay, so good. That was, that was the threat that was held over um, preachers' heads. Um, the tax uh, exempt is that they, they would status. have that removed if they kept talking about politics. Well, thank God that's gone. Well, that that's the Johnson Amendment way back with Lyndon Baines Johnson. He's the guy that put that in there. And um, People have got to keep in mind, there is no principle in the Federalist Papers that talks about the separation of church and state as we talk about it today. It's Tell not me where there. that comes from. It comes Jefferson from... Jefferson wrote one letter, wrote right? One letter talking about the importance of keeping the church business out of the government business. That's what he was talking about. Because they had a Church of England. That's right. A, a state church. That's right. And that's one of the reasons they left, because they couldn't right. practice their individual religion. That letter, if you read it carefully, has absolutely nothing to do with um, uh, separation of church and state. But that's what the schools the, are using oh, oh, absolutely. as a means of uh, cutting back on saying the pledge to the flag because it has under God in it. Hallelujah. The, the things that you just talked about, the principles that your mother taught you were reinforced in the school and reinforced oh, in the absolutely. church so that when children children didn't walk through life wondering well what what is the moral value they didn't have to make a moralistic decision based on their friends you were decisions. taught you knew you knew consciously you knew by the time you were seven what was right and what was wrong most of us did and there is were, a right and wrong mike oh no kidding yeah yeah no kidding there's a right a lot and of a people wrong. don't want to face don't want, that they, they don't, see that's not politically correct so the so the uh, we have so many excuses now for why um, certain age groups behave the way they do. And just remember that an uh, excuse is just the cousin of a lie. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just important that we look at these kinds of things. And we're letting them get away with it. Well, we are and we aren't. I think it depends upon what administration you're in. We've had, we've had um, since uh, Reagan, we've had a, we've had a uh, Bush senior in the office. Uh, I don't, well, he was law enforcement, not as strong as he could have possibly been, perhaps. Then we had a Clinton, and then we, no, yes, and then we had a Clinton, and then we had a, a Bush, mm -hmm. and then we had uh, an Obama. So we've had four presidents now that have kind of been politically correct, and political correctness is not necessarily the good way to, to, to uh, talk to anybody. I, I think you folks out there would rather, if you knew me, you'd rather me tell you exactly what's on my mind, and even if it spilled out funny, we could at least explore the way to have a skillful discussion mm -hmm. and maybe come to a solution. But by the way, that's what's not happening in Washington, D.C. right now. Let me talk to you real quickly ah. about the five principles of a skillful discussion. First off, you have to be able to pay attention to your intention. You know, what are we here for right tonight? We, we have to pay attention to what we're trying Stick to do. Stick to the topic. Try, try to pay attention to our intention. And we're going to try to build shared meaning with the audience and with ourselves. You know, we're going to try to do that. We're going we're to try to, to uh, uh, balance advocacy with uh, inquiry, which means that, you know, I come to this table with a position based on my years of experience. You do. So we're going to try to balance that by asking each other questions, try to think about it through and through. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my self-awareness as, as a tool. I know who I am, you know who you are, so we have to be careful of that. And then we've got to be willing to um, uh, explore the impasses. And that's not what they do in Washington. No, in I Washington, know. it's we're all... We're here. We're here, you're here, and there's no middle, and so therefore we're going to get absolutely nothing done for the country. Yeah, how, how responsible is that? I hope, I hope a whole heck of a lot of them get replaced. 2018 is coming, and um, in the last three elections, and, I, and people down there in Washington still don't get it, uh, the conservatives asked for, uh, and it started with the Tea Party, and of course they, they, they were vilified by the press, but the Tea Party said, okay, uh, give us the House. We did. Give us the Senate. They did. Give us the President. They did. And they still can't get anything done. Well. So, okay, look out. Here it comes. Because well, there's some you people have three, that are go. three dissenters, right? 
in, for health care, he had three dissenters the other day, and one of them being John McCain, one of them being the senator from Maine who's now running for governor. And, uh, You're kidding me. No. So it's going to be a very... Collins? As she's, she's claiming, oh. she's talking about running for governor up there. So it's I love be, the governor of Maine. So it's going to be a very... He's a pistol. It's going to be very <laughs> interesting to see what's going to happen. Well, you so. know what? Here, that brings another thought to mind, Mike. Who's going to run against, uh, who's up for, is Welch should be up for re-election. Welch is up. What about, uh, um, is, is Bernie? Bernie up? Bernie's up. Yeah, I don't well, Bernie, think. Bernie's claiming he's going to run for president again. Um, oh, hallelujah. So this, this, this should be very interesting. <laughs> but it does bring up a very interesting question because uh, look at the three folks that we have that represent Vermont. And let me ask you something. Are they really representing Vermont, or are they representing their own self-interest? And I would beg to differ when anybody would say to me, well, they're representing Vermont. I don't agree. I can't tell you in the last year a thing that the two senators have done for, the, for, for Vermont. Uh, Vermont has still the fastest exiting population, 45 and under. There are no jobs. There are no jobs in Rutland. There are no jobs in St. Albans. It's very scattered, and it's very low wage. Uh, and the... Uh, increase of wages over the last uh, four presidents has been almost nullified. And then you've got um, uh, Welch, who uh, comes back to town and does a lot of talking, but not a lot of action. So these guys are all three non-action uh, type folks. Well, I'll tell you where they are action. I don't like it, but they are action. They come back with our taxpayer money that they've taken from the Social Security Fund or wherever, you know, there's no lockbox on the security, Social Security Fund. It's a bunch of IOUs, yep. right? Yep. So they, they take our money from wherever down there and they bring it back here. They ride in on their white stallion and they snip the ribbons and, you know, they only go to the places where they're bringing money, though, I noticed. I would well, like right, to see a town hall with one of them here, or all of them at different times here. But um, I have not felt represented in Congress for years and years and years. Well, you, you, you and I would not feel that way because we're so conservative. And, you know, I, I don't believe in a uh, encumbering government. I, I think you should have as small a government as Absolutely. is possible. And uh, because I believe that, you're not going to talk to a Senator Leahy or a Senator Sanders or a Representative yeah. Welch and have them look at you and say, well, I believe that too. Because they don't. They believe that the bigger the government the and the more people that are beholding to the government, the better off they are. And the bigger the government, the less empowered <coughs> the people are. Right. The more control over you. You think you're so fortunate that there's this program coming into the state or to a special group of people all the time, new programs, new money. Well, let me tell you, every well, time you accept those monies... Wages are suppressed because still in America, the, the, the driving engine for taxation, the, the tax roll, comes from those who are working. So the, the uh, wages have been suppressed because we have that $22 trillion debt. 20, so I, yep. can't, I can't give you... Uh, a five dollar raise or a one dollar raise or a twenty five cent dollar a twenty five cent an hour raise i can't give it to you if i know darn well that i'm being taxed to death and that it's going to encumber more and more of my business i can't do it so who who gets who who gets crunched the businessman mm -hmm. and the employees who are working their little fannies off in order to get th the money necessary to live but also pay the taxes people that are on um uh, complete assistance pay very little in taxes. Now, Do they that pay does, taxes at all? Oh yeah, sure, sure. If if you well, if you're on complete assistance, you're probably in government housing, so you're probably not paying any taxes in set, in, except for when you go to the store and you have some cash. But those who are um, not on uh, full assistance, but are on some form of government take, uh, they they'll be in an apartment house and they think well. Um, this is being paid for a little bit, so I'm working two or three jobs and I'm trying to make it all in, and I, I love those people. They were trying, but they're, they're government-subsidized, their housing. Again, that's, that's 
being paid for by you because the landlord is raising your rent. Okay, so every, every time you get a raise in rent, it's probably not because the landlord's greedy, it's because he's working on a very small margin. Obviously, the landlord wants to make a little bit of a profit, that's why he bought the uh, apartment house or the duplexes or whatever he's trying to sell to you. But he's also got to pay all the taxes, all the things that he's being charged for. Linda, I bought a house 10 years ago in Rutland City. My first tax bill was around $2,500. Got, got the bill the other day, it's at $5,800. Oh yeah. In Ten years time. Yeah. There's no there's no excuse, and I look at what it's paying for, nothing. Well, I, <laughs> I haven't no. got a road that hasn't got Hold fifty on. potholes Hold in it. Hold on, education. Oh, Vermont folks, for those of you who haven't heard me before, Vermont's average per pupil cost is nineteen thousand dollars. The national average per pupil is 10,700. We are spending almost twice as much. And I believe that is because, well, it's for a few reasons, but one is that we've lost 26,000 students since mm -hmm. 1997. <coughs> and so instead of downsizing the government establishment in each school, they keep the number of employees or increase them for special needs of all one kind or another, and um, they don't they don't reduce the the costs for the taxpayers. Even though you have what one quarter less is it uh, approximately a, a quarter a fifth less uh, students. So um, I think that that has to be addressed. I think it's ridiculous. And um, it's not fair to the taxpayers. That's where the biggest share of your property taxes go. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a huge proponent of education. There's nothing more important for our young people than a quality education. I would run things if, if God came down and said, Linda, I'm crowning you the queen of education <laughs> in the state of Vermont. I would see to it that children had a phenomenal education, but I would put them in classes, whatever the grade, fourth grade, and there's a certain curriculum for fourth grade, only children who are able to perform at that a range in that classroom would be in that classroom. Um, because that way we can keep advancing their knowledge without having to, you might not agree with me, and you don't have to speak to that, but. Well, no, you're talking about differentiated education, and that's exactly a part of what we're supposed to be doing if we're educating children. But, but the first thing we have to do, Linda, is we've got to realize that children need to be able to read. Right. They need to be able to write, and they need to be able to do mathematics. Absolutely. Those are the three basics. The basics, and they need to know about their country. The, well, that would come in reading. I mean, you, you, don't, you, don't, have to have, you don't have to have a reading per se, be uh, Dick and Jane. Reading can be the Constitution, it depending upon the age. They level, wouldn't even know what Dick and Jane and Spot are all about. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that's a piece of the problem, is that children, uh, believe it or not, there's 26 different ways to learn to read. You know, some, some, some kids can learn to read phonetically, but if you don't hear sounds correctly, how do you learn to read phonetically if you don't hear sounds correctly? And by the time a child is up there, third, fourth grade, and they haven't discovered that phonetically he's not doing it. I'm in favor of phonetics. So, well, phonetics for some kids, but what about children that sight read? They can just look at the word, have it said to them a few times, and they, they, they never forget that word. That's a sight reader. What about speed reading? What about a kid that can, can, can I'm a speed reader, for instance. I can, I can look at a page and... And you absorb the content. Absorb it. Right. I'm not. I'm it a slow, people slow crazy reader. Because I, I, I go through a book and they say, how'd you do that so fast? Oh, I'm a and slow And I'll even reader. tell them what page such, such and such is on. I just did it just recently. Wow. And people go crazy. But I got taught that. I was taught by a fifth grade. I had three great teachers in my life. Mrs. Kennedy, who I love to death, who was Miss Morris when I first went to the fifth grade, but she got married during the school year. The oh, boy, you lost her. Bum. <laughs> and, then, and then I had, I had a... Uh, uh, high school civics teacher by the name of Frank Litka who had been trained at Norwich University and he was terrific. And then I had a teacher in the junior year in college by the name of Mr. Donnelly who uh, came out of the Kennedy administration, believe it or not. And those three were awesome. They spent time with their students. 
and that meant not a student, but we became learners, and we became, we became lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. I still read 52 books a year. Oh my one gosh, a week. wow. And people say, how do you do that? Where do you find the time? You do, because you're, you're trained. Wow. You've been, you've been, you've been taught well, by good gift. educators to do that. Oh, it is a gift. That but is it's, a gift. But you know what? We're all blessed with these intelligences. We all have seven or eight intelligences, and we, it, it's what we do with them. You know? well, and yeah. then you, when you're talking about the child that comes to the classroom, you got to find out the way to make them want to do that. What do you do with the musician that is gifted musician and they come to the public school and you don't create the reading, writing, and arithmetic around that, that intelligence? Well, how can you do that for every single child's differences? You have to become a really passionate teacher. You have to really want to teach like the old school teachers were. Yeah, the old school teachers were, were on top of things like that. Well, today we have now an IEP for every student, right? Yeah. Which is, to me, ridiculous. Anyway. Anyway. Speaking of um, education, and by the way, folks, I think there are some phenomenal teachers out there. So do I. And I truly believe they are trapped in a broken education system just like our students are. And I'm praying that the new Secretary of Education we haven't heard a word yet about education, but I'm hoping that the new Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, is working really hard on transitioning us into a better scenario for educating our children and for making our teachers happy to go to school each day. But okay. not to name drop, I personally know Betsy DeVos. Well, excuse me. I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and she's one hard-nosed lady. She's I bet a she is. Multi-billionaire, you know. I know. Well, the Amway Corporation, the that, DeVosses. That, that, I was that, an Amway distributor years that, ago. That was so I, I, I might have met. No, I don't know if I met her. I went to some of their big uh, rallies and things. Yeah. Rallies, yeah. yeah. Okay, colleges and universities. Oh boy. Okay. Yeah. Freedom of speech and freedom of religion. All right. I'm talking freedom about freedom to think. Freedom yes. to think for yourself. <laughs> How about being exposed to different viewpoints? That's what college was. I is uh, when I was a kid and went to college. That's what it was supposed to be all about: was that you that you were exposed to many different viewpoints, and you had you had a choice to either go to those uh, lecture those or those uh, uh, speeches, or you didn't. And I went to many that were would be uh, in, uh, today they'd be shut down. Yeah, they'd well, be shut down, and that's to the left or the right. They'd be shut down because people on campus would say, "No, no, 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 you can't hear them." Well, what do you mean you can't hear them? Um, that, that's that's so craziness. That's that's part of freedom of thinking, the ability they have to, to learn. Hear more than one perspective, and if I were a parent of college, uh, you know, entry level uh, students today, I would be doing my homework about the schools and making sure that there was freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and empowerment of the student, and that they would allow conservative speakers on campus. Do you know what I'm, this is how I think. Again, if I were in charge, which I, we all know I'm not, and never will be. You got your TV <laughs> show, you're speaking right now. Some people uh -huh. are listening. Um, I think that one, one way the federal government could deal with this scenario, this liberal progressive scenario that's going on on our college campuses where they have crybabies and they have safe spaces and, and they rise up when there's a conservative speaker coming. What the heck is wrong with them? But anyway, I would say the government will not give any funding to a college or university that doesn't allow for free speech, freedom of thought, et cetera. And also, I would go so far as saying it will never happen. The federal government, now in control of college loans, right? Mm -hmm. That they would not lend money to a student unless they were going to a college that allowed free thought and so forth. Well, that'll be interesting to see what uh, it'll never what, happen. What, what, what folks think about that. I mean, it, 
It, it, it's a shame that if you're going to spend um, some parents as much as $250,000 on a child's education, they come out and they aren't able to think both left and right of issues. Uh, that goes to the heart of those skillful discussion things that I just laid out, those mm -hmm. five principles. But if you don't have those opportunities, if you don't have a chance to voice your uh, concerns at a table, you can't build shared meaning. So if you don't Even build shared questions. meaning, you walk away with nothing. Well, that's balancing advocacy with inquiry. Yeah. So you and I have, let's say, a position. We, we, we can balance that. I can balance my advocacy because I've been trained to do it with inquiring your, your thoughts and maybe we can come to the middle and have a genuine change of mind to the middle that helps everybody. But that's not occurring. And right now when you find out that professors won't even allow students to speak in the classroom with a difference of opinion or challenge the opinion, uh, that professor should be told to sit down and shut up. If I were that allowed. student, I would go to the president of the college or university. They do. They get thrown out of school. And I would say, you don't have to throw me out. I'm not coming back. Well, that's, that, and that, you just that go happen. and see if you can get somebody else to pay for this hogwash. Well, there are some colleges and universities in the country that have your philosophy. In oh, that. Hillsdale College is one of them. So, you know, you'd have to pick and choose as a parent where those kids are going versus, you know, they're going to Harvard or Notre Dame or wherever, you know, so uh, I know those two colleges have some controversy behind them. Uh, Notre Dame, uh, it's shocking, but that's the way it is. <laughs> so, well, you know, how to, how, to take, how to take the education at the highest level and, and make sure that children don't come out as mush heads, as many people in this country say. They're coming out not knowing anything, and then they wonder why they can't get a job. Well, if you're sitting in front of a conservative businessman, and believe it or not, or businesswoman, because did you know that more than 50% of all the major companies in this country today are run by women? Most I'm people not don't know surprised. That. People don't know that statistic, but women are rising up and becoming. Well, you're not going to sit in front of somebody as a new college student and say, well, I think it should be all this and that, and companies Get make over too much yourself. money and all that stuff. You're not even going to be hired. I Get wouldn't over hire you. yourself. I wouldn't hire you. You know, it'd be. Oh, and this is this. Oh gosh, you got me going. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a couple of other things I want to talk about. But what is it with women today? Whining and wanting this and that, and we're not empowered. By gosh, just empower yourself. This is the this is the greatest time in the world to um, uh, to be a woman. Quite frankly. I, I'll tell you a really quick story. Most people don't know. I, I went to school because I could run. I could really run really, really well. So um, I have a very good friend, and I'll mention her name here in just a minute, and you'll all know who I'm talking about. But when I was at uh, my college, uh, the track coach, I was the track coach. Uh, I was the captain of the track team, and the track coach came and said, I've got a woman on the um, field hockey team that would like to run the mile, and we need competitors. But Mike... It's going to be controversial. This is 1960, what year was it? 1965, I believe it was. 1965 that he came to me and wanted me to do that. I said, I don't understand the controversy. We need runners. We need points. If she can run, which was my event, the mile, let her run. So um, she got to run. Well, I was shocked because they had the next day when she came onto the track and had her hair fixed up in a bun so she could run, and there were NBC and ABC and CBS, they were all there, and reporters and all this stuff. This was a big deal. This was a woman that was going to run the mile They run. all knew. They, they all knew. It got out there in the press, and it was, a big, it was a big press deal. My point was, I thought it was great that a woman would be chasing me once. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was just, that's just <laughs> But um, she went on to become the very first woman to ever run with a number in the Boston Marathon, Catherine Switzer. And she and I... Uh, have remained friends for years. She comes Aww. to Rutland. She comes to Rutland along with Bill Rogers and runs the Crowley Road Race every single year. But there's there's an example of an empowered woman. Back in 1967, when she ran that race, the Boston Marathon, she they tried to remove her from the race. Jock sure Simple jumped off. They, 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 it was unheard of. They thought women would die on the spot if they ran that far. Oh, the and poor she, weaklings. Right? Exactly. Oh, those were the things that were said. So women have come a long, long way in what they can do. And uh, heaven forbid that we go back the other way because uh, we have people that are championing that. And I hate to tell you this, it's the socialistic, progressive, democratic side that's championing the fact that women cannot do what they can actually do. I'm a great believer in women are just as good as men at doing anything. Well, some things. <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about mixing women on a men's track team. 
I think they ought to have a women's track well, team. Well, they back there in those days they didn't even have women's track teams. Okay, we won't argue about it. They, 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 <laughs> they, they, they didn't have them. I mean, it just it was just unheard of. It was very rare. The 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 old <clears throat> uh, Wilma Rudolph was in 1960. That was unheard of. She was a great. great oh, I runner, remember. Yeah. But um, um, what the Soviet Union did back there in those days until they started giving uh, drug tests, they had the press sisters who were ma men. They were they were huge. They weren't men. They yeah, they were. were. They, 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 were, they were dressing up men. They got caught, and they, they got stripped of their medals. The press sisters were men. Oh. And, and they, could, they pretended to be women? Yeah. That's oh, what my the, God. That's what, the, that's what the Soviet <laughs> Union was doing. So it, it, it's, it's crazy stuff back there in those days. We've well, come a long way. I know we're getting down to the last fast. Maybe three or four. I know it goes fast. But you're going to have to come back okay. because I, we have several other important topics to discuss. We're not done yet, but um, let me see. Um, I'll, I'll skip that. Anyway, Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Arizona is now 85 <coughs> years old. He has been a stellar example of what a sheriff can and should be. And um, he has now been, the Obama administration um, wanted to put him in jail um, and punish him um, for enforcing federal law. For enforcing <laughs> federal law, yes. He kept track of illegal aliens that came through his jails for committing various crimes. Uh, his department would turn the illegals over to ICE, as we should do for deportation. Nearly 35% of the illegal immigrants that were arrested for crimes would return to his jails over and over again. So either they weren't being deported or our borders were so porous, as they still pretty much are, uh, they came back to commit more crimes. What kind of federal government would go after a sheriff who was trying to fix a problem rather than going after lawbreakers? He enforced the laws, and the Obama holdovers want to jail this 85-year-old sheriff who did his job to protect the American people and to follow the law. It disgusts me. There's a uh, pardon coming there in a hurry. You wait and see. Well, Trump, the Ninth Trump Circuit Court of Appeals just said he needed to go to jail. So I hope there's, he'll take it to the Supreme Court. I, so I, I'm going to send him a check. I don't think it'll ever even get there. I think, I think um, Trump knows who he is. Trump's going to pardon him. I hope so. So he should, because there's a, there's a man that did not violate the law. He's trying to enforce federal law. And if you're, if you're Donald Trump and you are, as you say, you are totally supportive of the uh, American legal system and totally uh, supportive of the, of the police and the absolutely uh, service, he's going to hear of this and he's going to say, you're pardoned, you're, you're out of here. So that's, uh, that would be the easiest and simplest way to do this. But he may let it run through the court to see what the Supreme Court is going to say about the attempt of, of an officer of the law to enforce law. Absolutely. Maybe he should go to the Supreme Court. And we should honor them for that and oh, no support kidding. them. No um, kidding. Before, we're down to the last minute. I want to just say to the folks out there, um, my heart breaks for the Harrigan family who lost their little son uh, just a few days ago. Um, I, when I read the accounting of his life in, in the paper, I brought back memories to when my son was that age and what a joy he was as, as I know this young man was to his family. And I just want you to know that my prayers and thoughts are with all of you uh, with, in your loss. Uh, it just broke my heart to read that. And um, anyway, we never know what kinds of trials and tribulations we're going to have to face. And um, hopefully this will have somehow, his loss will have a positive effect going forward in some way, shape, or form. Um, because he, he definitely appeared to be a wonderful little boy. So I uh, thank you so much thank for coming you, on for again. Me up it's always fun. We never run out of things we, to say. We don't. <laughs> Call in next time. Oh, that's right. Well, the, the phone number is not on there. It was. All it was through the show. There? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I should have reminded. Next time, remind me to run. Okay, folks, good night. Have a great week, and I'll see you next week.